Well, greetings again, brothers and sisters in the Messiah. Welcome to the house of God. Of course, if you're in Yeshua, in Jesus, I usually use his Hebrew name, Yeshua, you are part of the spiritual house of God. So welcome especially to my brothers and sisters in the faith who are in Kenya, Australia, United States, around the world, China, all of you, especially also those of you who are right here in Florida. This is Philip Shields, and looking forward to addressing this topic with you, and uh, hope you get a lot out of it. I think we're all pretty familiar with the story of John 8. You know, the story of the woman caught in adultery, in the very act. How embarrassing. <laughs> I've always, how horrifying. I've always wondered where the man was, and that is so unfair that he wasn't brought to Jesus in John 8 as well. But the point of this teaching today is to look at the story with fresh eyes. I assure you, most of you will leave this teaching today with a far greater appreciation for the brilliance, the awesome grace of our Master Yeshua, the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. Christ means Messiah, means anointed, uh, the Son of God. Remember, 2 Peter, I think it's 3.18, tells us that we are to grow not just in grace and knowledge, but in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. We're we're to grow in the knowledge of Him, understand Him, know Him better. Not just knowledge for knowledge's sake, but to know Him better, 2 Peter 3.18. A lot of people say 2 Peter 3.18, grow in the grace and knowledge. That's not what it says. Grow in the grace and knowledge of, about, and belonging to Jesus Christ. Okay? So that's what we're going to do today. And in this, in this message, we are going to grow the grace and knowledge of Yeshua. So turn with me to John 8. I might have your Bible open. Um, if you're home and able to open up your Bible, I, I, I wish more of you would do it that way with the Bible open. You'll get so much more out of it if you hear it with your own Bible. This message will be about that, John 8. It's, and, uh, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now, remember, there were no chapter breaks. John 7, he is addressing the people on the last day, that great day of the feast, which I showed in previous sermons, was actually the last day of the feast, which is the seventh day. The last day of the Feast of Tabernacles is not the eighth day. It's the seventh day. And so uh, the eighth day is an an entirely different feast. So anyway, so John 8, uh, at the end of the seventh day, they usually took the booths down um, because that's what God commanded. Not, they didn't keep their booths up for eight days or ten days or stay in temporary dwellings for more than seven days. The Bible says seven days, so they took them down. And many people would then go to the Mount of Olives and just camp out and sleep there under the stars. And that's probably what Jesus did in, in John 8, verse 1. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now, early in the morning, he came again into the temple, meaning the temple complex, um, not the, the temple building itself, because only priests could go in there. Okay, so... Um, Uh, And all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. So remember, this was right after the Feast of Tabernacles we read about in John 7. And I think it's very conceivable that this event we're talking about here in John 8 may very well have happened on the eighth day, right after the seven-day Feast of Tabernacles. And why is he teaching? Uh, Because it's a holy day. And if so, this is the final holy day of God Almighty. Remember, their booths came down on the seventh day, okay, not not the eighth, like I said. And teachers often sat down to teach. Notice he's in the temple complex or precinct, okay, he's in the temple complex. And I've been there many times. Yeshua was not a Levite, so he actually could not have gone in the temple. Everywhere you go around the temple for acre after acre after acre, it's kind of like 20 or 30 football fields wide and long, uh, was solid stone everywhere. The ground you stood on was not dirt. It was stone, um, beautiful stone. And the pillars and the walls, everything was marble and stone. So keep that in mind as we get into the story. In fact, when you leave the temple precinct and come out of the area down down below, it's still all stone down there. But any, it still is. But anyway, uh, Yeshua is about to be set up by the Pharisees, the ancestors of the modern Orthodox Jews. So in John 8, verse 3 now, please follow along with me if you can. 
And then the scribes and Pharisees. The Pharisees, was a really, they, they were a religious group, um, very, very strict uh, in their beliefs and interpretations of the law, and they added a lot of traditions of their own, oral law, they called it. They brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this one was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? So this was a trap. The Pharisees interrupt his teaching with a woman caught in adultery, probably threw her on the ground in front of the whole crowd there. You know, where's the man? Maybe he was another Pharisee for all we know. But to be fair, the man, the male, should have been there. But he wasn't. Let's see what the law actually says, the law that they were referring to in Leviticus 20, verse 10. Leviticus 20, verse 10 says there, The man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he who commits adultery with a neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. So both of them were to be judged, condemned, and executed. Deuteronomy 22 22. You know, by the way, by Jesus' standards of if you so much as look upon a, a woman, and you might say to women today upon a man, to last, to lust after him or her, uh, you've committed adultery already in your heart. We all would have been guilty by the higher standards of the spiritual intent of the law. But in Deuteronomy 22:22, 22, 22, if a man is found lying with a woman married to a husband, both of them shall die. The man that lay with the woman and the woman, so you shall put away the evil from Israel. If anything, the emphasis is put on the man first here. And by this standard, that was Deuteronomy 22, 22. By this standard, many, many, many people, perhaps many of us, would have long ago been stoned. Even King David, Bathsheba, Bathsheba uh, uh, means daughter of the covenant. Bathsheba, interesting, considering what was happening. We make a covenant at marriage. Um, and, and David means beloved, so beloved and the daughter of the covenant, and many, many others would have been stoned, but they also were forgiven. But it's a sad and cruel and unjust situation that only in this case the woman was brought to trial, so to speak, before her her um, community of peers, if you will. And that's so typical of men, though. I mean, King Henry VIII, for example, he couldn't abide the whispers, and he was looking for a reason to get rid of Anne Boleyn anyway, because she couldn't produce a, a living son for him. So he couldn't abide the whispers that Anne, his, his uh, second, I think his second wife, being unfaithful. So even though he himself had had many trysts up and down the land, resulting in many illegitimate children that he'd begotten, come to think about it, the children weren't illegitimate. The ones committing adultery were. There's no illegitimate child. There are a lot of illegitimate parents. So King Henry self-righteously had his wife, Anne Boleyn, beheaded, and though he seemed to get away with his own infidelities. How unfair. Okay? And he will be judged by Almighty God. He really will. So back in John 8, in the scene here with Yeshua, Jesus, and the woman caught in the very act. <laughs> Imagine. Imagine she wasn't very well dressed still, maybe. I don't know. Do you see? Do you hear? Do you feel the trap being set? If Yeshua doesn't agree to have her stoned, he'd be breaking the Torah's rules that the adulteress and adulterer were to be stoned until they were dead. If he does agree to have her stoned, they'd call him a hypocrite because he'd be compromising his teachings about gracious forgiveness so do I forgive her or do I not forgive her? He'd be seen either as a fraud if he does agree to have her stoned or and a hypocrite if he agrees to have her stoned. On the other hand, he would be unjust to the law if he doesn't. So do you see and feel the trap? What would you do? So John 8, verse 6, is there, getting, is there any way getting out of this? I, I'm sure they thought we got him now. This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus doesn't answer them at first. He stoops down, John 8, verse 6, and writes on the ground. 
And so it says, he wrote on the ground with his fingers, the ground, okay? With his finger, as though he didn't hear. Now, here's where it gets real interesting. Story starts to get real interesting here. Yeshua was being tested, tempted, everything else, tried, so they could accuse him of something. And now what he does is write on the ground. I used to think he must have picked up a stick or something, but that's not what it says. He says It says he wrote on the ground with his finger. And later in the story, they began to leave. Why? What would make them leave? What was he doing? What was he writing? What was he saying on the ground? Now, let me speculate a bit. I admit it's speculation. I could be wrong, but hear me out. I'm not the first to think this. I used to think the ground had to mean a plot of dirt, soil, earth, okay? But remember in verses 1 and 2, we are told that he went to the temple. Folks, there's no dirt. There's no soil anywhere near the temple complex. There still isn't in what is called the Temple Mount area even today. They kept that area in, in Yeshua's day very clean. And acres and acres around the ground, the ground that they stood on, was all solid rock. The ground they walked on in the temple complex was solid rock. There was no just dirt there. It was all built up rock. Okay, It was a rock platform that was as big as several, many, many, many football fields in size. It's huge. Are you catching my drift? How do you write on rock? And that's what the ground had to be. And how do you? And it was at the temple. So how do you write on the ground on rock with your finger? Of course, this is about Yeshua, who also was able to do other impossible things like walk on water, or command a dead man for dead for four days, Lazarus to to come forth. Well, the Greek word here for ground is Strong's word 1093 ge ge meaning, I, I don't know if you pronounce it gay or gay, okay, gay, meaning ground, earth, or that on which we walk and stand. That on which we walk and stand. We say that today. Hey, I want to be grounded. I want to be on solid ground. Well, you might be, uh, you might be on your driveway, uh, which is not dirt. That's solid ground. You might be on your lawn, uh, on grass, okay? You can fall to the ground and be on rock or dirt or anything. It can mean whatever you're standing on, apparently. So whatever is down there below us. But my point here, the word ground does not have to mean dirt. It does not have to mean loose soil. I checked it out in the Complete Word Study Dictionary of the New Testament Words, second edition, uh, Word 1093, the second definition is, at, uh, as that on which we tread the ground. I looked it up in Vine's, commentary, Vine's Expository Dictionary. And the word simply, it simply says this. It, uh, I'm quoting here. Gay, it says, G-E, can often simply mean the ground, as in two sparrows falling to the ground. Matthew 10, 29. Can, would two sparrows fall to the ground? Your father not know it. That could have meant that they fell on a grassy ground or a field or stone temple area. Okay, Jesus told the crowds in another place when he was multiplying the loaves and fishes to sit on the ground. That ground probably was not loose dirt, but probably covered with grass. Mark 8, verse 6. Mark 8, verse 6. So I, I, I've seen the likely spot where Jesus told them to sit on the ground. But in this case, in John 8, writing on the ground in the temple complex just means he was writing on that which with on, on, on that on which we all would stand and all around the temple was solid stone foundation solid rock i believe there was a miracle going on here my point is this and perhaps one reason why they all began to leave when they realized they were in the presence of a higher power higher than normal that they were used to I think as the people started to realize he really was writing on stone with his finger, it gave them the Ouija beach, it gave them the, a sense of awe, the, uh, the hair in the back of their neck began to curl up. If it was stone, 
that in turn was making them realize that they were dealing with someone far more amazing than they were willing to tangle with at that moment. Perhaps we know it was the one who became Yeshua who wrote the original Ten Commandments on stone with the finger of God. Be turning with me, if you would, please, to, um, well, I'll, I'll turn there later. We'll read it later in Exodus 31. But anyway, um, could Yeshua have been writing down some of the Ten Commandments? Could he have been writing right onto stone ground of the temple? He did it before with Moses. Why couldn't he do it now? He can multiply loaves and fishes. How hard would this be? He was God in the flesh. Why not? Jesus or Yeshua, like the name his mama gave him, Yeshua, meaning salvation, wanted to show kindness and grace to this woman, especially as unfair as it was since the other offender, the man that she was doing it with, wasn't there. But the law required justice, and it certainly wasn't just to just have her be killed, would it be? Even if, by the way, if Yeshua had agreed to have her stoned, listen carefully, that still would not have fulfilled the law. That still would have broken the law, which said both offenders, the man and the woman, were to die. We read that earlier, Leviticus 20.10. But it would have been a wrong teaching to deny what the law said. She was guilty. She was worthy of death. Now, what could Jesus do? So in verse 7, he upholds the Torah. And so when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Or let him cast the first stone. Okay. Now, in the... Uh, there's a there's a verse I think in Deuteronomy that says um, that if there's going to be an accusation resulting in stoning, the ones to throw the first stone were the ones who brought the accusation, and the ones bringing the accusation by bringing the accusation were also implying we are not guilty of that. So therefore, we have a right to throw the first stone. And that's kind of what Jesus was referring to here. He who is without sin among you. Okay, go ahead, throw the first stone. But now notice what happens. They haven't left yet. They all have a stone in his hand. The only ones without a stone in their, in their hands, as far as I can tell for sure, uh, were Jesus and the woman, and presumably Jesus' disciples. Everybody else that may have had a rock ready to do it. Certainly the Pharisees did. And so he says, He who is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. Now, John 8, verse 8, And again he stooped down, continued writing on the ground. The ground, remember, was probably rock. He was in the temple complex. Solid rock. Whether he was up above on the mall area or down below where the merchants and money changers could have been also, all of that, even to this day, was and still is solid rock. Now stop and think. It says he wrote with his finger. Is it possible to those that were watching him that those watching him were watching him write something into very stone. He was scratching something right on the stone with his own fingers, and it was coming out into words. It says he wrote on the ground. The first time we are told that Yehovah, the same being who became Yeshua, writing on stone was when? Let's read it. Keep your finger or marker somehow, a piece of paper in John 8. We'll come back to it. But turn now to Exodus 31. Imagine how neat that would be if you could write on stone with your finger. <laughs> so we're going to take a little detour now back to the book of Exodus and get a little foundational groundwork. Come back to John 8. I know if I'm trying to engrave something on stone or metal, you can't even use a regular pen. You've got you to gotta use a special tool, right? So Exodus 31, verse 18. And when he, that's Yehovah, had made an end of speaking with Moses up there in the Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets, not tables, guys, okay? These aren't two big tables of granite stone. Moses couldn't have even begun to have lift that, okay? He gave Moses two slates, okay? Two tablets of the testimony. Tablets of stone written with the finger of God. Okay, so this was the other time God wrote with his finger. The Ten Commandments written with the finger of God on stone. 
In John 8, the same being, now Yeshua, is once more writing something with his finger, and I believe, onto stone. Well, Moses came back with those two uh, slates or tablets that could be held in one hand. You'll read that, we'll read that next in chapter 32, Exodus 32. These were not uh, 400-pound monolithic granite tables of stone that you see in depictions. No, these are two small tablets written on both sides that a man could carry and run down a mountain with in one hand, okay? That he could carry in one hand and run down a mountain with him. And also would be small enough to fit into a fairly small ark or the box, you know, that was that was in the Holy of Holies, the ark. So now let's pick up in Exodus 32. The children of Israel were now in the midst of building the gold calf. Well, God the Father was talking about the priesthood and the tabernacle and all of that and everything he was going to do for Israel. Can you imagine? Now we're in Exodus 32, verses 15 and 16. And so Moses turned and went down from the mountain, and the two tablets of the testimony were in his hand, in one hand. So these are not big, big tables of stone, okay? The tablets were written on both sides, on the one side and on the other side they were written. And now the tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. Now, if you read the story in Exodus 32 on your own, this was the time uh, when the gold calf was happening. And um, uh, it says that when God, uh, Moses got down to the bottom in his fury and his anger, righteous anger, he cast the two tablets. He was furious. You know, sometimes when you're so angry, you just throw something down if you're really angry. And he had what he threw down what he had in his hand, the two tablets written by the very finger of God. I'm sure he felt terrible about that. But uh, in interestingly, God doesn't condemn him for that. Um, he broke all ten. He broke all ten commandments. Moses, in his anger, also ends up breaking all ten commandments. They had broken the law about the gold calf, and now he's broken all ten. Moses had to go back up, chapter 34, and receive a new set, an unbroken ten. You can read that in chapter 34 and verse 1, Exodus 34, verse 1. And the Lord, or Yehovah, said to Moses, Cut two tablets of stone like the first ones, and I will write on these tablets, I will write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Okay, Moses did break the Ten Commandments, literally. So where did that second set with the Ten Commandments go? This all has everything to do with John 8 and the woman, so, so bear with me. They went in the ark. I'm, let me make a note here. They went in the ark beneath, covered by that golden lid on top of the ark called the mercy seat. The uh, caparet, I think it was called. The solid gold lid of the ark was called the mercy seat. It covered everything inside. So when Jesus is writing the second time, the Yahuwah, Yahuwah is writing the second time, the one who became Jesus, um, he is indicating that the second writing of the Ten Commandments, and that copy was not broken. That copy was the one covered by mercy. <coughs> so when Yahuwah looks at the law... The law is what reveals sin. Sin is the breaking of the law, right? So we know what sin is because of the law. So the law condemns us as being sinners because when we break the law, we are sinners. So now when Jehovah broke, uh, uh, looks at the law, first of all, he sees it covered by that mercy seat. And on top of the mercy seat is sprinkled the blood, okay, once a year on the Day of Atonement. And the blood on the mercy seats covering the sins which are revealed by the two tablets of the Ten Commandments. So when Yehovah sees the blood, in this case on the covering of the mercy seat, what does he do? He passes over our sin. Do you remember what God said to the Israelites at the Passover in Exodus 12? I want you to remember the wording there very carefully. And I'll be speaking much more about this in the weeks to come. I'll probably have two or three more sermons before Passover. Exodus 12, verse 13. 
now the I, I hope all of you, even those of you in China and Kenya and Russia and France, all of you hear my voice. I hope you will keep the Passover this year. Remember what Moses and the Israelites were told by God. Exodus 12, verse 13. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And the blood was put on the sides of the door and at the top of the door. Okay? The lintel and the doorpost. And he says, And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Okay? One of the signs of God's true people. He says, this shall be a sign. The blood shall be a sign. One of the signs of the God's true people. And I wish I'd included this in my recent sermon on signs about God's people, of who they truly are. These are people who are covered by the blood of the Lamb. The Lamb is Christ. Do you remember what John the baptizer said when he saw Jesus beginning his, at the beginning of the ministry? He said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes, away, who takes away the sin of the world, not just of the Jews, not just of Israel, of the world. John the baptizer was a priest, son of a priest. And he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I want you to focus on the word takes away and the, also the word world and the world lamb. He's the Lamb of God, takes away the sin of the world. He doesn't just pass over our sins because of our goodness. He doesn't say, When I see your goodness, I'll pass over you. He doesn't pass over our sins because of our works. He doesn't say, When I see all your good works, I'll pass over he doesn't pass over our sins because we're trying harder this year than last year. What it does it say was the reason he passes over our sins. When I see the blood, when I see the blood of that innocent lamb that the father of the household selected and the father of the household killed, when I see the blood smeared on your doorpost and the top of your door. Now, we're not told what Jesus wrote. So it's the blood that keeps him from destroying us, like he destroyed the firstborn among the house, houses of Egypt. Now, we're not told what Jesus wrote with his fingers on the temple ground, which was probably stone, and he wrote it on his, with his finger. Maybe he wrote the words mercy, grace, forgiveness. Some feel he wrote down some of their names and maybe some of their sins. Others are certain, again, that maybe he wrote down the Ten Commandments. We're not told what he wrote down. Whatever it was, once the others read it and realized that he was writing on temple stone floor ground with his fingers were convicted in their hearts and didn't want any part of this. So let's read it again. John 8, verse 9 now. Back to John 8. Then those who heard it, John 8, verse 9, then those who heard it, heard what? He said, those of you who are without sin, be the first to cast a stone, okay? Then those who heard it being convicted, by the way, the only one who was, who was there without sin, he didn't have a stone in his hand. That was Yeshua. Right? Convicted in their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. Yeshua, Jesus, was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. He still apparently stooped down, letting them do it. Now we're going to look at the brilliance and the love of Jesus here. Remember the Jewish religious leaders were striving to trip Jesus up. They're trying to trap him. Was he going to abide by the Torah and agree to stone the sinful woman or show his way of grace? Remember, we are to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ and Lord and Savior. So how could he, how could he let her off the hook under these circumstances? There was another law 
that Jesus had aimed for, that Jesus had used. And you might have missed it. How could Jesus allow a woman caught in the very act of adultery to get off the hook and still claim he was keeping the Torah? How could he show her mercy and still claim that he had done according to the law? Do you see the problem? Do you see the importance of him maneuvering this very, very cleverly, very brilliantly? Here's the brilliance of Yeshua in this scenario. He sees the woman is torn up. He sees the woman die a thousand deaths, not, would not want to have this going on in front of everybody. No doubt she would have liked to have been forgiven. No one wants to die such a humiliating and slow death as stoning. But she'd been caught in the act of having sex with someone else's husband. Where was the husband, right? Well, there was another law in the Torah that also had to be obeyed. Let's read it in Deuteronomy 17. Deuteronomy 17, verses 6 and 7. Deuteronomy 17, verses 6 and 7. Now, when the people all came with that woman caught in the very act, I'm sure there are lots of people who said, yeah, I saw her, I saw her in, in that room with him. I saw her in a bed with him. I saw the action going on. Yeah, I probably had lots of witnesses. Here it is, Deuteronomy 17, verses 6 and 7. Whoever is deserving of death shall be put to death on the testimony of two or three, minimum, okay? Two or three witnesses. He shall not be put to death on the testimony of just one witness. You have to have at least two people. Someone's going to be killed for something. There have to be two witnesses at least, preferably three at least. And the hands of the witnesses shall be the first against him to put him to death. And afterwards, the hands of all the people. And so, and so you shall put away the evil from among you. So they're saying the first ones to cast stones were saying they hadn't done the same thing. They, they had a right to accuse this person. They hadn't done the same thing. And they therefore could be, be the first ones to cast stones. Okay? But the point is, there had to be two or three witnesses. That's repeated again in Deuteronomy 19, two chapters later, verses 15 and 16, or verse 15 anyway. Deuteronomy 19, 15. One witness shall not rise against a man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commits. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. And then in Hebrews 10, 28, anyone who rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. So you could not put someone to death unless, unless what? Unless there were at least two or three witnesses who could corroborate the accusation. It was against God's law to execute anyone unless there were at least two or three witnesses. So why am I saying all this? Back to John 8 again. John 8, verse 9. Let's read it again. Then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience, something that he wrote on the ground, and maybe as they saw him writing, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest to the last, and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up, so he's still down on the ground up till this point. John 8, verse 10 now. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? Where? I, I thought we had a lot of people here wanting to see you die. Where are, where are all the witnesses? Where are all the accusers? So verse 10. The required two or three witnesses have gone. So now it would be illegal to stone her because there weren't two or three witnesses. So whatever, in fact, even if Yeshua wanted to stone her, one, one's not enough. You had to have two or more. So whatever Yeshua, whatever Jesus, Yeshua, wrote on the ground and watching him write on the ground with his finger caused everyone to leave. All the witnesses were gone. Jesus has asked her, where are all your accusers? Has no one condemned you? John 8, verse 11. She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Brethren, there is so much more in that verse than I've seen before. 
And I, you know, I, I think I've talked about it a little bit, bit before, but there's going to be more today than I've explained before. There's so much going on here. Grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeshua asks, where are the witnesses? There had to be two or three. None of them remained. Therefore, she could not be legally stoned. In fact, the only one without sin, Yeshua himself, was the only one without a stone in his hand. The only one who could have stoned her if there had been two or three witnesses by the standard that Yeshua put down when he was the one who was giving the commandments. Let him who is without sin cast the first stone. He was the only one who could, have, who could have done that if there were other witnesses. But now he says, neither do I condemn you. First thing he says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, we've heard a lot about go and sin no more. I want to ask you a question first here. Just take a little detour here. What if that woman had been caught again a few days later, brought to Yeshua again, or brought to you if you were the judge? What would Yeshua have said the second time, the third time? Now, there were some of the Ten Commandments that were considered, that had harsher, that had death penalties. One was to be a murderer. Adulterers also received the death penalty. Um, and people bowing down to wrong idol, bad idols, Sabbath keeping. Those were, those were death penalty. Those were death penalty, um, commands. Okay? It was not the death penalty in the Old Covenant. If you stole something, you had to restore what you sold. I think it was fourfold. In some cases, fivefold. I think it was fourfold. It was not the death penalty to covet. It was not that now the coveting might have led to a death penalty command. Now we know the wages of sin is death. I know that, okay? I know that too. But I'm saying as far as when you look at what the penalties were that were imposed in the old covenant, um, you had to be a very serious person dishonoring, very seriously dishonoring your parents before that would even be cause for death penalty, for example. Very, very serious. Uh, so... Uh, most you know, most of the commandments, especially the last six, were not, except for adultery and murder, were not death penalty commandments in the Old Testament. But in the New Covenant, sin is sin. You break one, you break them all. And um, now let's get more more personal. Have you not ever had to repent? What if this woman had been caught a few days later and brought to Yeshua again? Have you not ever been had to repent of the same shortcomings. Let's call it what it is, the same sins, more than just one time. Of course you have. Of course you have. Okay? Even Abraham, father of the faithful, even Abraham, what did he do? He lied about Sarah twice. I think that's in Genesis 12 and 20, if I remember right. I'm just doing it off the top of my head. I think it's Genesis 12 and 20. Forgive me if I gave the wrong chapters. But... Um, he, he lies about Sarah trying to hide the fact that she's his wife. Now, she was his half-sister, so that's probably how he justified it. But his intent was to deceive. So we all have done the same things many times, the same sins many times. Of course you have. Don't lie and say you haven't. And what do you expect God to do? What do you hope God will do? You hope he'll forgive you, right? So let's read a couple of verses. Luke 17, verses 3 and 4. Luke 17, verses 3 and 4. Take heed to yourself, Luke 17, 3 and 4. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. He does have to repent, okay? Forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, forgive him. Well, Peter had heard that, so in Matthew 18, Peter comes along. The same teacher who said, "Sin, go and sin no more, had also taught, this is what I'm saying, he'd also taught us to be forgiving of one another, even for the same thing, same person, seven times in one day. 
seven times in one day. I don't know how many of us are real good at that or would be real good at that. I can think of a lot of examples. If somebody did something that really bothered you and really angered you or really sinned against you some way, and then does it again and then does it again and then does it again seven times in one day. And each time says, I don't know why I keep doing this. I'm so sorry. You are to forgive him. And then, but you know, there are many preachers who would say, well, he hasn't repented if he keeps doing it. Repentance means change. And if he hasn't changed, then he hasn't repented. Haven't you heard that? Now compare that to what Yeshua said. If he sins against you seven times in a day, Luke 17, verse 4, and seven times in that day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Don't be giving him sermons about you haven't really repented. If you keep doing it. The same teacher who said, go and sin no more, now goes a step further. In Matthew 18, a big step further. Matthew 18, by the way, he practices what he preaches. He certainly forgives us seven times a day constantly, doesn't he? Matthew 18, verses 21 to 22. Passover is coming up. I want to glorify my Savior. I want to praise my, my Jesus, your Jesus. I want to say, praise my salvation. Matthew 18, verses 21, 22. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and then I forgive him? Up to seven times? I don't know what's going on here. If Peter maybe had already forgiven Thomas or something six times or seven times for the same thing that day and um, was feeling kind of, well, I'm abiding by what my teacher has said, but you do it one more time, Thomas. Hey, you've had your seven times in a day thing, okay? Jesus said to him, Matthew 18, 22, I do not say to you up to seven times. Basically, he says to Peter, quit counting. Quit counting. Believe me, Father in heaven and I don't count your sins. The number of times you do the same thing over and over and over again and say, oh, I'm so sorry. I really am. Please forgive me again. I don't deserve it, but please forgive me again. So he says, I say, I say to you, not up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. That's an expression in Hebrewism, in Judaism, in Hebraicism. That just means forever and ever without number. It doesn't mean 490 times. It doesn't mean you're counting. Okay, buddy, you're up to 283 times already. Okay, you're up to 486 times. Five more times and I'm going to get you. Okay, that's not what he's saying. Forever and ever. Have the attitude of being like I am. Forgiving, Jesus is saying. I'm not saying like Philip Shields is. I'm saying like I, Jesus Christ, would be saying. <clears throat> so seven times is not enough in one day. Peter must have felt pretty good, implying he'd already been willing to do that. And now he's saying, quit counting. Now let's kick it up even more. We've got the sequence backward. Back to the woman in John 8, caught in adultery in what Yeshua said. Notice the wording Yeshua spoke in John 8. Let's go back to verse 10. Yeshua had raised himself up. When he'd raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, were those accusers of yours? Has no one remained to condemn you? What's going on? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. He says that first. Go and sin no more. Now, first of all, let's understand something here. Jesus is not just saying, I've got the uh, spiritual eraser and I've just erased your sin and no consequences. Don't think this woman's sin was simply glossed over. It was not. It was not. Her sin was harshly condemned, severely punished by an excruciating ex ex execution. That's where we get the word excruciating. goes to the word, the kind of pain you would suffer from, a, from being crucified, excruciating, crucified. And, 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 and not just her, uh, not just, he, 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 it wasn't just being glossed over, and, 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 it, it, but by him. She didn't have to go through it, but he did. 
Yeshua took the condemnation. He took the consequences of her sin, the death penalty. He took the condemnation on himself. Now, there were other consequences of her sin. I'm sure if she was a married woman, it would have had severe, wreaked havoc on her marriage. I'm sure it wreaked havoc on the other man's marriage. I'm sure it wreaked havoc on the, havoc on the way everybody looked at this man and woman. Yeah, there are other consequences and how familiar we all are of consequences of sin because we're all sinners. Anyway, he took the condemnation on himself. He took the curses of breaking God's law, the death penalty and other curses on himself. He even took the severe punishment of her sin on himself. He was the one judged. He was the one condemned. He was the one beaten. He was the one lashed with lash, lashes. He was the one crucified for her sin and for mine and for yours. And this notion that he was beaten with only 39 lashes, that was a Jewish law. These were Romans who were beating him. They had no such law to limit it to 39. What they did was take you to the inch of your life in that scourging that he went through for us by his stripes who were healed. I'm going to do a sermon about the big swap, the things that he went through so we don't have to go through them. It's far more than just forgiveness. Far, far more. And I hope you'll glorify your Savior when you hear that. Therefore, she didn't need to be judged because he did all that. He incurred the wrath, the anger, the horrific anger that God has over sin. God hates sin. And God is a just God. And when someone sins, there has to be a penalty. He doesn't just gloss over it. Jesus received that, ex that intense anger from Father when he took upon himself our sins. Therefore, she didn't need now to be judged or condemned because Jesus received her condemnation on himself for our sins. In Romans 5, verses 18 uh, and 19, Romans 5, verses 18 and 19, Therefore, as through one man's offense, it's talking about Adam, judgment came to all men, to all people, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, that's Yeshua, the free gift, the free gift. What free gift? Verse 17 says the gift of righteousness. Romans 5, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. You're, you're made just, you're made righteous, you're made right. By one man's righteous act, the free gift. I don't have to pay for a gift. I don't have to buy a gift. I don't have to work for a gift. I'm going to be giving a sermon soon on God's incredible grace. For as by one man's disobedience, Adam... Many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. By his obedience, I will be made righteous if I believe in that by faith. Now let's go back one more time to what Jesus says. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Frankly, over the years, I've heard a lot more preaching and emphasis placed on go and sin no more then on the first part of the sentence, neither do I condemn you. The preaching I've usually heard goes like this. Maybe I preached it in the past. If so, God forgive me. Let me move on. Uh, let me correct it. Here's the preaching I've heard in the past. If we don't sin, we won't be condemned. Right? You've heard that. That's the sequence. Don't sin. Don't get condemned. That's what we've always heard, right? Right? And there indeed are statements all through the Bible in Scripture that back that up. I just think that what Jesus does and what Jesus says is very instructive, especially for the new covenant. There is a new covenant. It is not a renewed covenant. It is not more of the old. It is a brand new covenant. He does not put the phrase about sinning anymore first. No, he doesn't say quit sinning. And then, I, then, I'll, then you'll be condemned, no, no longer condemned. He says, the first thing he says is, neither do I condemn you. Before we know we can live joyfully, obediently, and confidently, before we know that we can sin no more, it is so much easier to sin no more when we first have gotten rid of the feeling of condemnation. It's when people don't believe 
that you're changing. It's when people don't believe in the risen Christ living in you. And you just feel so condemned by your own family or by your own friends or by other people out there that it's hard to go on. But when you understand there's no more condemnation by the family of God, by Yeshua, by Yeshua, by Jesus, by God the Father, by your family and friends, it is so much easier to move on when you see the love of God in their eyes. He does not say, first go sin no more, then I won't condemn you. That's not what he says. He says, neither do I condemn you, now go sin no more. Are you hearing the difference? Before we can live joyfully, obediently, and confidently, we first have to feel no longer condemned. But so many of us go through life feeling condemned by God. Kind of like he loves me today, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. I'm part of God. I'm, I'm not part of God. You know, where are you, God? You see what I'm saying? So put it another way, because he doesn't condemn us, we're empowered to go sin no more. That's the sequence. Another example is in Romans 7. I'm not going to turn to Romans 7. You might, as I'm talking here, it might be good for you as I'm talking here. In Romans 7, Paul is focusing on himself in that chapter for, for a reason. And on his own failed, failed human nature. And what's the result when we focus on ourselves? When we see, when we focus on our own work, when we focus on what we're doing, when we focus on what we have done. If you're honest to yourself, it's condemnation and guilt. It's a, real, a realiza realization of failure to measure up, knowing we've once again failed. And he says repeatedly, that which I hate, I do. That's what happens when we focus on ourselves. You can read all through that in Romans 7. What's wrong here? We should be focusing not on ourselves, but on the one who takes away our condemnation. Focusing on what God is doing in us, not what we're doing. Focusing on what our high priest Yeshua is doing. I'll talk about that next in the next sermon. I'm not my own Savior. Yeshua is. I have only one Savior, only one Creator who's creating the new creation. I'm not the creator of my new creation, my own creation, my own new creation. If so, I botched it up, frankly, and so have you. So have you. When we focus on our own work, we will be depressed or feel boastful if we think we've accomplished anything spiritual. But Yeshua says in John 15, I'm the vine and you're the branches. As the vine cannot do anything by itself, neither can you, unless and until you abide. Make me, my, make me your home. Get stuck onto me like a good branch, a healthy branch. is stuck onto a healthy tree. And if you do that, you will bear much fruit. How will you bear much fruit? Because the tree is going to shoot fruit down to that branch. Okay? Nothing else. We can do nothing of ourselves. But if we abide in Him, we'll bear much fruit. And now we can do anything we want. Anything. That says that in Philippians 4, either verse 12 or 13, it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. <clears throat> but when we focus on God's work, we're freed from condemnation. We praise Him and we sing to Him. We feel good. We go on. We want to please Him. We feel indebted to Him to please Him. And so by the end of Romans 7, Paul, Paul pleads, Who shall deliver me from the body, this bondage of this death? And Paul gives the answer, I praise God through Jesus Christ my Lord. And that's the end of Romans 7. <clears throat> Just doing that from memory. But then from Romans 8, he begins with, there is now therefore no condemnation. No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And as for the remainder of Romans 8, Paul's focus now that he's, con now that he's not condemned, now that he's not feeling condemned, because he started chapter 8 of Romans saying there's now no condemnation. Why do you feel condemned then, you who hear this today? Why do you feel condemned? You've got to get over that. There should be no condemnation. If you've repented and you've accepted Yeshua as your Savior, you should practice Romans 8, verse 1. Paul's focus is now on what Yeshua is doing for us and in us and how we have no condemnation, and now we can live a righteous life in Christ. And indeed we will if we really understand it. 
You see, our Christ paid the penalty. He took the curse of the death penalty for us. And we died to ourselves, it says in Galatians 2.20, for I no longer live the life I live. I live by the faith of Jesus Christ and him crucified. Okay? That's my new life. And he says in Colossians 3, verse 3, that Christ, and verse 4, Christ our life. Okay? Christ our life. Colossians 3, verses 3 and 4. So he is now our life. That's the risen Christ life that the Father sees. So therefore, there can be no more condemnation. Now, does the condemnation return then when we sin in stumbles of our Christian walk? No, brethren. Now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. None. Once I'm in Christ, you see, I'm a child of God the Father. I may stumble, but I'm always his child. Your child may offend, do some offense of some kind, may not have come in when you called him or whatever. And is he condemned? Is he condemned to die? Because No, he's your child. Okay? He's always your child. And he will never leave you nor forsake you. It says in Hebrews, God will never leave us or forsake us. I think that's Hebrews 13:5, And he will come back to us and he will always look for us. Just like the good shepherd who found that he's missing one of his lambs or sheep. And he leaves the 99, presumably with a, another good shepherd. And he goes and looks for that lost sheep and gladly finds it. He doesn't kick it down the cliff. What are you, what are you doing over here? You know, nothing like that. Like some people might react. Uh, no, he picks that lost sheep up and joyfully brings it back to his home, carrying it on his shoulders. I'm going to say more about shoulders in the next sermon. We get it backward, though. We say, go and sin no more, and then we, or maybe God, won't condemn you. But that's not what Yeshua said. That's not the order or sequence he said it in. In the new covenant, salvation, Yeshua, Jesus, that's what Jesus or salvation, Yeshua means, salvation, he says, neither do I condemn you. Then after the condemnation is absent and removed, then we can go and sin no more. But as we've sinned, as we've seen, we all do still sin. Sometimes even the same sin, sometimes even the same day. After we've been forgiven, don't we? But we're not already perfect. Maybe you're not either. Or do you never sin? No, we all still sin. Sometimes even the same one, like I said about Abraham, Genesis 12 and 20. Even Abraham, the father of the faithful, had to learn real faith. He was very human, very normal. But in the end, he believed God, and that belief in him, in God, was credited to him for righteousness. And in Romans 4 and Romans 5, it, we're, we're told the story about Abraham in those two chapters. I think it's Romans 5, that it wasn't written just for Abraham. That was written for all of us. So don't think you don't still sin. You do. It doesn't mean that you've lost, that you've lost your non-condemned. You're, you still are uncondemned if you're a child of God. Repent when you sin, but you're not. You, God doesn't want you feeling condemned all the time. Got to stop that. We need to repent, yes, but he doesn't want us feeling condemned all the time. But if you think that you don't sin anymore, boy, I don't, I'd like to meet God, I guess, in the flesh. <laughs> But don't you ever once in a while lose your temper or your patience? Do you never have a lustful thought or a coveting thought, something you can't afford or shouldn't or would like to have but can't afford? Do you always keep the Sabbath perfectly? Or do you not once in a while break the Sabbath? Do you put other things ahead of God once in a while and have other gods in that sense? Come on, brethren, we all sin. But we should be sinning less and less, that's for sure. In the Old Covenant, the order is obey first. And then I'll bless you. In the new covenant, it's believe first, and I will remove the condemnation. And now you can go and properly, more easily obey, especially with the life of Christ living in you. Especially through Jesus Christ, our life, our new life. Okay? That's the key in the new covenant. Now, Yeshua came to do three things about our sinful lives. First one, he came to forgive and pay the penalty of our sins. 
I don't know that the lady caught in adultery really recognized that. We have to believe in our hearts that our Master Jesus is our Savior, confess that with our mouths, that He is risen and He's coming to save us, and believe in Him. That comes first. Romans 10. Romans 10, verses 9 to 13, that if you confess with your mouth, Romans 10, verses 9 to 13, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Okay? That either means it or it doesn't, brethren. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. But with the heart, one believes unto righteousness. With the heart, you believe unto righteousness. That's the righteousness by faith that I've been preaching on and off about. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture says, Whoever believes on Him will not be put to shame. Brethren, I want to talk to you, brethren, in Kenya, my brothers and sisters in China, or Russia, Australia, or Brazil, in Israel, in the Philippines, in France, wherever you are, in Australia, I said that already, maybe, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Not just the Jews. For whoever, verse 13, calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So it says in verse 12, For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. Romans 10, verse 12. No distinction between Jew and Greek or Kenyan or Russian or Chinese or Filipino or Brazilian or Mexican or Puerto Rican or whatever. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. <clears throat> so that's the first thing he did. The second thing he does is uh, by, by doing, uh, by paying the penalty uh, of our sins and incurring the full wrath of God on himself, he removes also all condemnation against us. He doesn't just cover it up, but he removes it. He takes it away. In the Old Covenant, the best that could happen, that's what Hebrews, uh, the book of Hebrews is all about in chapters uh, 7, 8, 9, and 10 especially, where it just talks about how the blood of bulls and goats can't remove sin. It can cover your sin. That's why we call it Yom Kippur, the day of covering. Kippur, covering. Or Kippurim, coverings. Okay, it's a day of coverings. But the blood of bulls and goats can't do it, brethren. It can't cover. I think that's Hebrews 10.4. But when Yeshua came, John the baptizer didn't just say, here's the Lamb of God who's going to cover our sins. He says, here's the Lamb of God, John 1.29, who takes away takes away the sin of the world. You can cover dirt up by, 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 by sweeping it under the carpet or by sweeping it behind the door or something. Okay, it's out of sight, but it's still there, isn't it? <clears throat> so that's why every single year the high priest had to go all alone, barefoot, just his white tunic, into the Holy of Holies. <clears throat> Excuse me a second. <clears throat> But John the Baptist says, here's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And not just for Jews, but for the whole world. He says, take away the sin of the world. Okay? Takes it away. Are you getting it? And this is what the adulterous woman caught in the act was experiencing. Whatever Yeshua did, whatever he wrote with his finger on the stony ground of the temple, drove away the accusers. The accusers stand for Satan the devil, the adversary, the slanderer. That's what devil means, slanderer. And Yeshua stands up to Satan and, and, and works a, a defense for her. Okay? And when we're trying to slander and defame others, we are working for him. He is the, he is the slanderer. We shouldn't be involved in that kind of stuff. I'll have nothing to do with websites that slander other people by name, that put them down, that name them by name. Okay, now in severe, severe cases, yes, people are named by name. Janice and Jambreeds and a couple others. But uh, we need to be aware that that is something very serious in God's eyes. He doesn't like brethren talking about brethren, okay? <clears throat> so remember, he's saying all of this, that neither do I condemn you, okay, to a woman who just minutes before was having sex with someone else's husband. Just minutes before. But once he takes away our sin debt, we're still penniless. So point number three, 
So point number three is Jesus becomes our righteousness by faith. And I gave a sermon on that in December 2012, the righteousness of God by faith. And I hope that you will hear that uh, because it's very, very important that we get that. He gifts us with his righteousness if we believe in it and ask for it and receive it by faith. Romans 5.17, Philippians 3, verses 9 to 11. That's not the point of this sermon, but I will be talking about it more and more in the future. <clears throat> I'll once again give this third, third point in the coming sermon about the richness of the blood of Jesus as we come nearer the Passover. And if you want to learn more about it, uh, to begin with, the righteousness by, of God that he gives to us. You know, we are to seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. And Jesus' righteousness, not my own. I don't want my righteousness. Like Paul said in Philippians 3. I don't want my own. I want the, the, uh, God's righteousness that he's going to give me. So let me repeat, in the new covenant, when we stand before Yeshua in repentance and confess his sacrifice and believe in him, he says, not just to the adulteress, but to you and to me, what's your name? Put your name in there. Blank, you know, your name. Neither do I condemn you. Zhang Wei in China, whatever your name is. Oh my, in Kenya, whatever your name is. Paul, Peter, Tanya, what's your name? Put your name in there. Neither do I condemn you. That comes first, the removal of condemnation. Then in turn, he gives us the joy and the love and the confidence that now uh, we have the risen Christ living in us by his spirit by which we can now obey. <clears throat> but it's hard to sin no more unless you first know you've already had your sin, that what you've already done has been erased. Okay? And it's really hard to believe in God's love when you feel condemned, either from God or from those professing to be his children. So that's what the adulteress was experiencing. The people of God, the Jews around her, were condemning her when they themselves were also sinners. And yet the Holy One was saying, oh, no, I don't condemn you, okay? And um, so and the penalty of her sin and incurring God's severe wrath was put on Christ. Now there's another story, be turning to Luke 7, of another woman of ill repute who anointed Jesus' feet with expensive perfumed oil, fragrant oil, as she washed his feet with her tears. Some think that that was the same woman uh, who was caught in adultery earlier, uh, Jesus, the same woman we, we've been talking about, who comes later in Jesus' ministry <clears throat> and does this. But now Yeshua is, is uh, discerning that the Pharisee was judging him for allowing all this to happen by such a horribly sinful woman, touching and fondling his feet and kissing them and crying on him and wiping his feet with her hair. I mean, so and he started getting dirty thoughts about it. And so, you, I mean, the Pharisee did. So Yeshua tells this story. Okay, Luke 7, verses 41 to 50, a certain creditor had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. Let's just say someone owed um, someone owed uh, $1,000 and the other one owed a million dollars. And when they had nothing to, with which to pay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will feel a greater love? Which of them will love him more? Simon, this was the Pharisee, answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. He said, you have rightly judged. And then he turned to the woman and then said to Simon, he turned to the woman. Now the woman can see his face. It's an awesome thing to see the face of God. And then he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has washed my feet with her tears, wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss. This woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You didn't anoint my head with oil. This woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. It's a very humbling thing to deal with people's feet. And this woman was doing all of that. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, they are many. I know it, he says. I know it. Her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, 
the same loves little. And then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Those around the table were amazed by that. Who is this who even forgives sins? And then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Has saved you. Go in peace. Go in peace. You're not condemned. Have a peaceful heart. Understand, you're, it's okay. You're okay, okay? Now her faith in the saving grace of Yeshua, when we realize we've been forgiven much, her faith in that was just awesome. Love fulfills the law. God's law is about love. We can love better when we understand how much we have been, how much we have been loved. God tells us through John that we love because He first loved us. First John four nineteen. So the fact is, though we've all been horrible sinners, we've all been forgiven a lot of sin. All of us. It's just that some of us don't get it. Some of us don't realize that we we're just as bad a sinner. We're all people who've been forgiven much. Therefore, we all should love God so much. But some of us feel we're not as bad. Some of us like to be like that Pharisee uh, and the publican with a Pharisee saying, I'm not like that publican over there. But the publican could, could, could not so much as lift his eyes to heaven, but said, Lord, forgive me. God, forgive me. A sinner. And which one went to the house justified? No, it was the publican who got justified. Okay. We like to come, and on the other hand, we like to condemn each other. And that's got to stop. The condemning of one another has got to stop. When we realize how much we've been forgiven, we've got to come and, we like to come and praise the head of the body, which is Jesus. All the while, we're punching and boxing and hitting his body, the members. No, my brothers and sisters, that has to stop. The Christ takes it personally how we treat each other, for we're treating him that way. We're members of his body, Romans 12:5. Those who are forgiven much, love much. We who are guilty, okay, <clears throat> of so much sin, need to understand that. All right, so let's review here what we have. But we've got to stop condemning one another, and especially condemning our own family or something like that. We are the family of God. We are all guilty of much sin, all of us. So all of us should love him much. Many feel in their hearts and in their heart of hearts, that they're better. We've got to stop that, okay? Now let's go back to John 8, because I think the full gospel story of the saving grace of Christ, who by his wondrous deeds opens the door to the kingdom of God, I think that whole story is right here. And then in John 8, let's go back, let's review real quickly. Yeshua could have condemned her, but he didn't. Yeshua wrote with his finger in the stone in the groundy, in the ground, uh, the stony ground. These were big, big blocks the size of a desk. Okay, that were the that were, were the foundational stones that they were standing on. <clears throat> you see, still see them to this day. Uh, the stony ground they stood on, and whatever he wrote, and how he wrote it with his finger, caused the witnesses to leave. You had to have two or three witnesses of a sin before someone could be stoned. And they all left. And so now Yeshua could legally and lawfully release her from the stoning penalty. Yeshua then takes on himself the penalty of execution, though she didn't realize it probably at the time. And this in turn allows Yeshua now to be able to say to her, Hey, I don't condemn you either. And then he says, Go and sin no more. It's the joy of feeling uncondemned. It's the joy of knowing your sin debt's completely paid, and, 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 and that allows us to live a more holy, obedient life with the risen Christ in our lives by his spirit. I hope this sermon today has helped you grow in appreciation for our master, Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus our Christ. We're all commanded to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. I hope that's happened for you today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's all praise Yah. That's what hallelujah means. Let's all praise Yah. Yah is the shortened form of Yehovah, okay, or, or Yahweh, or however it's pronounced. But um, it's a short form, just like Phil is a short form for Philip. So what a loving father we have. He had a choice. He could have spared his perfect son and condemned all of us. Or he could have spared all of us. 
by not sparing his perfect son. That's what he chose to do. He spared all of us. What an awesome God we have. And what Jesus went through, what Yeshua went through for you and for me. I hope we really, really appreciate it, especially now as we come to the Passover. Let me ask a blessing on you. We'll end the message with this. This message has blessed you. Let others hear it. Tell them about it. And tell them about our wonderful Savior. That's the message. But let me ask a blessing on you. Close your eyes. Listen to the Father speak to you. Listen to Jesus speak to your heart. May Yehovah, our dear Father, our dear Abba, our dear Abba in heaven, may he bless you. May his face beam with joy as he looks on you and looks on me, forgiven, cleansed, washed, and uncondemned in Christ. May you feel you can come boldly to the throne of grace by Christ, in Christ, and receive unmerited pardon any time you so choose. Unmerited favor, in fact. And may you praise him, and may your joyful praises rise as a sweet-smelling savor before his throne. May you exalt Yeshua, your Savior, and as you do, may he grant you to sit with him on his throne in his kingdom. May our beloved Father watch over you. May he protect you, send his guardian angels over you and your family, guard you and your family and your home and your business. And may he bless you with your good health and bless your business, bless you when you travel, bless you when you stay home, bless everything involving you when we put our trust in him first. And may you be filled with the gifts of God's Spirit as he pleases. May you display the fruit of God's Spirit as Jesus Christ lives in you, as he works in you to the Father's glory. And may the Father bring you peace, his peace, his faith, his joy, his love. And in the name of Yeshua, our dear Savior, Amen. Until next time, this has been Philip Shields, your brother in the Holy Messiah, asking for blessings, peace, and shalom to all of you as you walk in his light. Until next time, shalom and joy. Bye for now.